Frederick, Frederick Lee uh, teach here, and I'm also the, the coordinator of this assembly series in the department. And today we're very happy to have uh, Mr. Simon okay with us. Uh, Mr. Simon is the uh, CEO of uh, Design in Hong Kong, and uh, he was also elected as the district councillor, mm. uh, which Hong Kong knew is part of uh, Papua. That's right. Uh, okay. yeah. And um, yeah, and then he recently completed uh, his uh, master's degree uh, in transport and planning. And he told me that um, this is his dissertation, right, for the uh, MA degree in uh, transport and planning. So the talk, okay, the title for today's talk is uh, "How Walkable is Hong Kong." So the question about how, according to the uh, abstract, okay, how to turn Hong Kong into more pedestrian friendly city. Okay, so without further ado, I can introduce. Thank you again. Yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, thanks for giving me the chance to, to talk, guys. So uh, you can see uh, there's a couple of things I want to go through, quite a lot of material. Um, the, uh, in, uh, kind of, I've been here for 30 years. I've been here since uh, 1987, but I was never, since 1984, but I was never involved in planning or anything. I, I, was, a, I was a consumer and operating a business here. Um, and only in 2003, 2004, I uh, got into issues like the harbour front. And from the harbour front, we got into issues about public space and heritage and wall buildings and the development of the city. Um, and um, uh, we, uh, for, uh, designing Hong Kong, which we have started up, uh, is really an, an act. It's, it's, uh, it's not a research, not think tank, but it's really uh, about efficacy, trying to get people to do better urban planning in Hong Kong and start thinking about topics. Uh, and the first topics we did was in 2004 was waterfront, and then after that was heritage with the Star Ferry Pier, and uh, after that it was street markets, and then it was uh, public space in private developments, and the kind of like topics have moved on since then. So we're looking at all over planning um, of the city, and uh, in uh, I came to study here in what was it 2010 or 2009. It took me three years to finish, rather than two years to finish. Um, so this is my transport planning. And it was really um, what, what initiated it for me as well was what we, we did a, uh, an, uh, kind of a, short, a small little Saturday morning conference on, um, on transport and how it's just transport in Hong Kong. And a friend of mine, Orrin Thatcher, he's an architect, but he specialized in um, um, uh, transport oriented facilities, so uh, airports and railway stations. So in the planning of them, so he always looks at pedestrian movement, people movement in, in them, and make them try to optimize and, and improve these facilities. Um, so that's his background, and and, and this is and I've, I've taken material here out of his uh, his presentation where he he's asking is transport a problem or a solution in Hong Kong. So he's looking, although we challenged it on public space issues, he, he took it from a transport side. Um, and you come in, it's you know it's Hong Kong's now for fantastic transport. It's extremely efficient, it's clean, uh, compared to any places in the world. We've got loads of different types of transport. We've got these mini bus services, um, ferry services, train services, taxi services. I mean, Hong Kong is known as a, as a very efficient uh, transport, uh, a town where we provide really efficient transport. Um, but can we have a more sustainable transport, you know, in a place where 90% of the people are already taking uh, uh, public transport? So how can you further improve it was, uh, was one of the questions he, he posed and he suggested how about try walking. So how do we move people from taking public transport and, and mechanized transport, how can we get them to walk? So it's kind of really the question is, um, you know, how can we get people to walk uh, further and longer before they consider taking transport? Um, and then he showed these photographs. Um, well, you probably want to take the bus as quick as possible instead of walking around. Um, you know, you're hand in by the railings. Um, you know, you're standing on the side of wooden roads. Um, and so he just showed these kind of pictures of the kind of stuff that we've grown accustomed to in Hong Kong as pedestrians. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at many of the places where uh, the pedestrians are forced into the footbridges and uh, ground spaces, I mean, you don't see in this photograph, you may, I don't think you see anybody walking, although maybe on the, at, next to the taxi there might be a person there. Um, 
in this picture as well, uh, I don't think we see anybody on the ground here, or we see anybody forced into a food bridge between two commercial sites. Um, and then there are areas where we have created massive wide corridors for, uh, for vehicles. And um, there's a few people on the footbridge, but the rest of the space is completely unused uh, by pedestrians. Um, nice park areas, uh, again, in, in the space where in the city where space is expensive. Um, and then he kind of showed pictures of, you know, it's quite easy to do, but big, big cities in other countries, kind of like, can we have this? New York City is probably something that we can take as a reference. And the question is, can we have that? Of course, we have high density to, uh, to work with. But he put these pictures up. Um, and, uh, and then he came with this uh, overview. Um, and this is uh, Kanran Hung Hong, the uh, Hung Hong station. And uh, you see here the uh, Kalum, uh, Hung Hong area. And, um, and then he kind of did an analysis by marking up this map and analyzing it. And he did this. He kind of made the roads white. Um, and the podiums, uh, the darker gray, and then the buildings, dark gray. So he started to kind of show, and he started to recognize that these islands exist, that our city has become a, a city of islands, and, and there is segregation. And then he started to point, accentuate that more by um, putting dark blue lines wherever there are railings that you can no longer cross the road. Um, and he started marking up the, the connections that are the elevated connections between those islands. And you start seeing the kind of how uh, the disconnects that started to develop. How within an area, um, like here, you can see that there is pretty much, you know, pretty extensive connectivity. But then you got these segregations by the major roads, and some of them get quite severe, and you get limited to very few links. Anyway, that is something that he put up, and um, I thought that, uh, that this always, I've used this, uh, I've referred to this presentation many times since, because I thought that this was uh, quite a good way of starting to study uh, what is happening in our city. Um, and uh, Hong Kong is very unique in the world in terms of its density and in the, in the use of overlapping pedestrian networks. I mean, tell me any other place in the world where you have like uh, subway, street level, and elevated levels all overlapping in one area, people moving at all three levels. There are, it's Hong Kong, we're experimenting with this more than any other city. And we have to recognize that probably as a strength rather than as a weakness. But we have to identify what the weaknesses are to see how we can get very good at it. And then other people can copy what we're doing. But um, I think we have to learn things. Uh, he, uh, he did some analysis as well by taking New York City and say if you go between the Grand Hyde and the Empire State Building, 650 meters, um, and you have, you know, you can take one route, you can take another route, and so you have a lot of choices of how you move around. And so that the flexibility, the freedom of choice, choosing your route is quite intense. Uh, you can then take the whole column to the Grand Hyde and Pacific Place. And uh, there's another, he measured at 650 meters. And um, so you start marking up where you come across the roads, um, where the street level connections are, where the footbridges are, and then try to determine the route that you can take to get between the two. And then asking the question, okay, how about an alternative route? And you're basically almost at the same route because you're limited by a few critical links in between them. If you're a tourist and you miss them, you'll uh, you have to walk a long way. Um, so, so that was uh, this. I, I, this really motivated me to uh, start looking at it uh, somewhat more. Um, so, uh, for the uh, my uh, dissertation, I, I got into looking into the documents that are kind of relevant to it in, in Hong Kong. Um, in 1999, uh, you see this, uh, this document where the walking is encouraged um, in the, as part of the objectives, the strategy within Hong Kong moving ahead, transport strategy for the future in 1999. And uh, that's a policy address, the walking comes up, and Transport Bureau announced the uh, pedestrian precinct study. This is kind of coinciding with, uh, uh, at that time, you know, most of our guys still very much linked with London. And Manual for Streets 1 was published in London. And uh, you can see that the, uh, the whole movement of improving walkability in the UK really kind of started this thinking here where guys here 
also start looking at the city and improving walking, and they kind of convinced um, the government to, to do something about it. Um, so the, um, in the 99 policy directive, it kind of reappeared, it kind of disappeared, and I, I, I didn't see much of it uh, since then, it kind of reappeared in the 09 policy address with the announcement of more pedestrian schemes like food bridges, subways, and, and so on. Uh, the precinct study that was done was done by Townland, which is a, uh, an urban planning firm in town, and uh, they described the problems in Hong Kong, narrow and overcrowded pavements, barriers to movement, uh, a lot of conflict between pedestrians and vehicular, um, unsatisfactory crossing facilities, pollution, unattractive streetscape, inadequate weather protection, poor signage, and unfriendly to the elderly and people with disabilities. This is 2001. Um, we got now about one out of eight uh, of the residents in Hong Kong are over 65. By 2030, it will be one out of four. Um, it's becoming a real relevant issue for the city if uh, we've got an aging population. Um, so the study then uh, emphasized this formation of comprehensive integrated networks. And um, so I think that the, the, the terminology comprehensive integrated networks, I guess, I think we'll have to analyze what comprehensive means. Um, and which includes the, its walkways, subways and elevators, safe, uninterrupted, pavilion present passageways for pedestrian movement between activity generation and attraction points um, so that we reduce the need for a short mechanized trip. So and we get pedestrians basically off the ground is what is really being said. The word comprehensive here um, doesn't indicate anything like, um, you know, can I sit somewhere or can I have a beer? Comprehensive here really is very technical transport planning. It's about links and connections. Um, and I, I have a, and you will see later on that I'll start to query that term comprehensive. The Road Safety Review from the Transport Department 2004 even goes a step further. The Transport Department is really keen to get us off the ground. Uh, they want to get rid of pedestrians, if they can at all, from, pedestrian, from the street level. So they want comprehensive segregated pedestrian networks. So that we have complete safety with maximum convenience. So as far as the Transport Department is concerned, people off the ground, only for cars, and complete safety, maximum convenience um, by doing so. Uh, transport planning and design manual stipulates that wherever um, possible great separating spruce and crossing should be constructed. Uh, there should be a clear correlation between the increase in the number of separated crossings and the reduction in pedestrian accidents. Um, the result now is that Hong Kong has about one footbridge or tunnel for every two kilometers of road that we have. This, uh, this excludes footbridges and subways maintained by private developers. These are the ones that are maintained by government themselves. So that's quite a lot. Um, and we have, uh, so this continues 2010, we're going to make more walk corridors. And um, the CE manifesto says. Um, we now need more lifts to get people and elderly to connect with those footbridges that we're building. So we're going to build, I don't know how many uh, elevators to get people up from the ground to the, uh, the footbridges. However, pedestrians do not like to use the footbridges. It has been identified by uh, the census uh, study, and this is this is actually comes out of the uh, report from the auditor um, as, that refers to the census. Basically, people uh, don't want to do it because they have to walk longer and uh, it involves staircases and ramps, so they want, don't want to use the footbridges. And police reports also show that pedestrian safety campaigns that show that pedestrians often ignore the footbridges and they will climb over curbside fences through the central reservations. Every morning when I pass Hang Hao on the way to Quarry Bay, there are the people, there's a footbridge right over the road and all the ladies will cross over the road, over in through the planter down. At just every morning, that's what happens. So every morning, I have to laugh, except for when the old lady almost stumbled off the, uh, and then she got scared by a car that came by very fast. So it's not safe, but you know, this is what people will do. 
the census 2003 really when they asked people what do you prefer and people say they don't want to add great signal for crossings and zebra crossings and cautionary crossings so that ends up 50A, 97, 22, there's about 70% and there's only 30% people that say I like to have the food bridges. So we have, uh, you know, we kind of have a conflict here with where transport department wants to go and where the public wants to be. So there is a, uh, a clear conflict. Uh, there was a publication by Ming Power Weekly fairly recently, uh, and which I recommend you read. It's uh, fantastic. It's beautifully illustrated, great photography, um, and it calls Hong Kong an unwalkable city. Now, if you would take any study format, uh, you know, you take a walking score from the United States, or you take any kind of way of, of figuring out whether Hong Kong is walkable or not, um, it actually shows that Hong Kong is extremely walkable, um, taking those scoring systems. And, uh, but if you really analyze why, it's really those scoring systems of asking the question whether you can buy toilet paper without a car, the use of a car. And that's what you can in Hong Kong. You can get to school, you can get to toilet, you buy your toilet paper, your medicine, go to, you know, go, go get your shopping, go to a restaurant without the use of the car easily. Any tourist that will come here, where they go to Europe or the States, you know you've got to rent a car. You go to Hong Kong, you don't have to rent a car. You can around without a private car. And really, if you analyze the, the, the way the, the American and European studies look at trade in walkable cities, they tend to be um, dominated by that question more than anything else. Because in the States, there are so many cities where you, you cannot go, sh you get your shopping done without having making first a car trip. And as a result, people become obese and all these problems. Um, so, uh, uh, so we have to ask ourselves then, you know, different question. I mean, can I go figure out and have a different way of measuring what makes a walkable city in Hong Kong if the, if the American and the U.S. systems don't work? Uh, I did a, uh, a, a survey. Let me see this. Uh, by sending out uh, to 15,000 email addresses that we have gathered as Designing Hong Kong um, at that time, uh, we were a little bit more now, uh, we, we sent out, to, so those are people who are interested in those issues, uh, we sent out a questionnaire, uh, we got about 500 responses, uh, but now it's about 1,000 because the questionnaire is still alive, but when we did this uh, analysis, uh, it was halfway, I checked it later, and the numbers are pretty much still the same now that we're about 1,000 responses. Uh, respondents, there's, you know, there's, there is a bit of, you know, you see, you see it's a bit dominated by Hong Kong Island compared to your population. Hong Kong Island should be 25 percent if it's equal to the spread population in Hong Kong. So we're underrepresented by the new territories in the responses. Um, male, or female, you know, I'm not too worried about that difference. Um, and I think the spread on age is also pretty good. Uh, and again, if you ask, you know, which route do you normally prefer to cross a street? 76% of the people say street level crossing. But we asked another question, and they will say, how, you know, we end then, we say when it rains and it's nice weather. So, um, when it, the weather is nice, it stays 78%. Um, but when it rains, people really like to use those. Uh, Great separated networks, whether it's subways or, or food bridges. Uh, they may use the subways, uh, the, yeah. but uh, I'm not sure whether their preference is that relevant. Uh, the difference in preference is that relevant. So I think the, the people just want to get weather protected. And there are so, ideally, then, if, um, if you want to give, uh, make high quality pedestrian networks in a district, you provide both. You okay, give great connectivity at street level and you make sure that you have a great network that's great separated and that's better protected. So, I, so from this, if you want to maximize, you want to make people in Hong Kong really happy and make them to walk a lot, you have got to give them both. Now what we have is we're having both, but it's disconnected. Um, if we ask them, um, see, not sure why it moved. please stick the most important factors in choosing your route. Um, the, the obvious things come out. I mean, there's no big surprises. Short is rude. Easy to find my way. Less crowded. Um, but, uh, you know, attractive route is something that people uh, identify as well. If you're really interested in this kind of uh, behavioral choices, I suggest you look at a back in new study that's recently completed comparing New York and Hong Kong in responses on that, this kind of question. Uh, so you did that with a professor in New York, you know, I think. Um, 
to do and uh, and look, and Lou did a study, um, and they compare they and they do the same questions in New York and Hong Kong. You get slightly different responses. There's a little different attitude about some of the issues about safety and so on. Um, but so you start, you know. Also, people will give you a fake answer. They give you the wrong. They, they behave different than what they tell you. Right? So, um, and then, but I, I think it's quite interesting if you're interested in behavioral choices issues. Um, okay, we kind of, I kind of try to further analyze um, the responses. So, you know, the people that said uh, it doesn't matter, I don't care what's how I walk. Uh, for them, the most important thing is that it's easy to find their way. Uh, for people that say that they prefer street level crossings, they usually say that it's you know, the shortest route. People that love the subways, um, although it's a very small group, out of the 80% uh, of those have basically looked for less crowded routes than their cho route choices. So it kind of makes it, they just want to get rid of it, get, get, rid of, get, rid of, get away from people. <laughs> you know, like more privacy in their walk, I guess. They want to find it more really comfortable to walk. Um, so anyway, but, so I think there is there is some uh, sense in, in taking this further. Um, this is uh, I tried to look at see that but the tourists there were very few tourists in this responses because it was a it was a, a, a survey done among a, an existing database of people that come to our event. So it's primarily <coughs> Hong Kong residents, so you don't have a lot of tourists. Tourists, but the visitors had ease of finding my way. I must say, tourists are really bad indicators on walkability. Uh, we've surveyed with people, people in the street, and your tourists, they don't care. They got a lot of time. Uh, they ask the doorman how to go. They kind of think it's cool. Oh, I'm in Hong Kong, so this is Hong Kong. You know, for them, it's uh, you, know, you don't get a good response. The best response we, we, we feel we get is for people that live in Hong Kong but don't live, work, or live in that area where you do your survey. They're extremely critical. So you live in Hong Kong Island, you've got to go to see the, uh, the, uh, the show at 8 o'clock in the Cultural Center. And you're arriving at rates. And these people are really critical. They do the maze of tunnels and finding their way. You know, they, they, they kind of go like, oh, I've got 10 minutes to get to the show. And then they get lost and they get irritated. And they, so they tend to be your more critical voices. The person who works in an area has already figured out the best way to go. So if you ask them, they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so their survey knowledge of the area uh, doesn't really help getting your responses on these kind of... If you want to try to find ways of... This is all about trying to find ways of improving your pedestrian network. Um, go and ask people that, that live in the city but don't ha uh, live there. Um, I've... Um, after my... Uh, let me just hand this out here. Is this for handing out? Yeah. I'm not sure who has a copy of this, but um, <coughs> what am I doing for time here? I, uh, I don't mind watches time still, although I'm looking at it. I see the clock. Okay, good. I'll try to speed up a bit. Um, so uh, at the after I've um, at the end of my uh, uh, and, and based on that, I've um, I, t I try to keep fine tuning this. I try to kind of look at this uh, walkability indicators uh, and uh, all from the perspective how can we improve things. Um, I think if you're going to ask the question how we're going to improve things and you look at uh, improving dist networks and districts, I think the measure's got to be the time that people are willing to walk before taking transport, um, the distance that people are able to walk within a given time that they are, that they're willing to spend on walking. Um, the time that people are willing to stay in an area for social activities and the time that people are able to stay in an area. Uh, able to stay, you know, think of uh, uh, weather and protection, think of toilets, think of food and drinks. Um, if, if there's no place to sit and you can't go to the toilet and you can't get anything to drink and it's stinking hot and it's no shade, uh, you're not going to be there. Uh, you're going to go. So uh, if you want to figure out, so I think. If you want to look at how to improve uh, walkability in a, in a district, these are kind of things probably as measures you could look. At a, I've kind of looked at uh, the, uh, the three levels, planning and uh, uh, facilities and then some policy support issues. Um, if you're going to plan district uh, on a strategic level, I think we're really going to need in Hong Kong uh, making strategic pedestrian plans. Um, looking at uh, 
comprehensive integrated pedestrian networks designed for an area-wide connectivity. A lot of the networks we see in Hong Kong are really uh, driven, or a little aspect of these uh, networks are driven by um, uh, the train station or the PTI. So your, your segregated network is driven by the links to the station rather than as, an, as a district network. It's to get you in and out of the station rather than to get you around the district. Um, so if you want to if you want to get the, the quality of the networks up, you've got to start thinking area-wide networks rather than uh, station-based networks. Um, I've been uh, told many times that priority for prisoners at street level may I, that I you know how about if we can do a really good job at, at segregated level? Why should it be a priority for street level? So. Um, it's probably because I uh, feel that that's important, but I've, I've tried to explain it to people that we c you can never ever copy the experience at street level at an elevated level for all kind of technical reasons. Um, there is, uh, at a subway level, you can't do it, you think of fire safety. Um, you can't, uh, you can never get the same number of connectivity points, you can never get the same um, uh, level of social experiences, you can never have the same amount of retail, um, opportunities, you can have, never have the same connection, so your, your engineering is really limited. Between the subway and elevated, uh, elevated at least the fire department can still put the ladder up, get you off the footbridge, but the subway you can't, so the, the calculation of the width of the exit has got to be balanced with the number of people that could be at any time in the subway network, so you're, you're highly restricted with what you can do it and can ultimately achieve as in terms of experience for people. Um, so, this, so the word priority here is, uh, is uh, I've made a conclusion, and uh, there is a lot of thought behind it, uh, but it's probably not necessarily fair to, uh, from a scientific point of view. Uh, safety, minimize conflict between, uh, with heavy and high speed traffic. Uh, I, you know, slow speed traffic, as, as long as you can get the speed down uh, between the cars and the pedestrians, then it becomes safer, uh, but, but people can be mixed. Uh, connectivity, uh, in the planning, uh, you connect, the plan for a compact neighborhoods, grid like street patterns rather than the big streets that are high capacity and so that you can't cross the streets anymore. Um, you know, you could you could make better networks by in the planning stage of districts already think about this. Um, increased density around transport nodes is what we are already doing. Uh, in Kitec for the first time we actually uh, have dropped the uh, have, have, don't build across the station. We always build, it to, if you transport oriented development, we build on top of the station, we can finance the construction of the rail with property development. In Kaitak, we, we put a park on top of the station. And the property development that gives us the patronage and the financing is built around the park. It, it makes it difficult from a financial arrangement, i.e. the MTR that owns the station doesn't own the land around the station, so whoever owns the land around the station on government has to subsidize the MTR then to build it rather than the NGR can sell the property and, and get the money to build. So, but in Hong Kong it can work because we have such a close relationship between the MTR and the government, but in other cities you may not have that. Um, direct connections, few detours and level changes. Um, so you've got to have high quality overlapping network, so you don't have to go down, up, down, up, down. So if you want things to be comprehensive, the overlapping networks got to all each of them have individually be uh, <coughs> be comprehensive in themselves. Um, enjoyment is an important issue. It's a sense of place. Uh, if you're really interested in sense of place issues, I suggest uh, you know you can either Jane Jacobs in New York City or the latest one is Young Gal. Now Young Gal and his team came out and they're looking at the Calum East of this moment. But this book, Cities for People. Is a real good one if you want to know more or have a better sense of what does that mean, sense of place, and how to make cities work and make sure people enjoy them. I think that Young Gale right now is, and, uh, is, um, is a leading that thinking in the world, um, uh, his team. Uh, other people that you could look at is uh, Project for Public Space, PPS, www.pps.org in New York City. Um, and. Uh, He's no longer alive, but um, there was a Dutch uh, ro uh, uh, ro uh, road engineer, uh, Mondeman, and he uh, did a concept of shared space.
So if you take those three, I think you pretty much have. And then I must say, still London transport is uh, pretty ahead of the game in, uh, in a lot of planning and thinking. And so enjoyment has a place uh, look at that. Okay, on the on the level of facilities we have on the next place, so then safety at each grade, uh, connectivity at each grade, enjoyment at each grade, no. sense of place at each grade. How do you do that in a subway? Um, do we have shops and services and subways, but how do we do it on an elevated level? Um, convenient at each grade and easy, easy wayfinding. So I think those are really the critical issues that come out, and I'll, I'll show you some, uh, some actual examples uh, by looking at Tim Tai Choi and so on. And on the policy support, you've got to make sure that you, know, you, you don't feel worried that there are people touting all the time. Oh, you know, you want to have a new suit and a new shirt. Um, which is horrible in Chim Chai Chai, it makes me stop him walking around. Uh, or in Mong Kok, where all these plastic banners are standing blocking your way. So you need to you need get rid of some crimes and touts to making things pleasant. Um, availability of public transport is important for making the city more walkable. And the high costs associated with car travel, we have to maintain that. We start losing it a little bit in Hong Kong right now. Uh, we see the car ownership going up dramatically uh, in the city. Okay, so those are some of the indicators in planning. I'll, uh, the, uh, following the study, I work closely with uh, uh, yeah, Civic Exchange, and uh, I, you can get it online. It's available online. It's walkable city living streets. Um, it was uh, it was with funding from the MTR, and we looked at several districts in the city, and we um, come up with some suggestions of how to improve pedestrian planning. So if you're really interested, then I suggest you look at. Uh, that's that one. And we're trying to organize a conference in May, uh, but we kind of look at transport, uh, um, connectivity, sort of transport aspect, the safety aspect, and the, pub and the public space aspect uh, in one day. And then we can try to bring that discussion together. We presented our uh, Tim Choi Choi study to the uh, Humberfront Commission I made uh, uh, last year, summer. Um, so, some of the conclusions good for health, um, pedestrian first approach to city planning, good, uh, makes the city, uh, makes people happy in the city, makes people come and enjoy the city, uh, makes it a better tourist attraction, people can walk about. Uh, and pedestrian networks is the city's most important public space. If, if you ask anybody anymore and ask about public space, they'll, they'll think about the park. Uh, but if you remind, ask people where, which public space they've been this morning, they won't answer, be able to answer the question. You have to remind them, you have to help them to make them understand they've walked on the pavement and through footbridges. So the most important public space that people enjoy every day and use every day in the city is your pedestrian network. It's the most important public space. So we've got to spend more time on making that really good quality public space, like we spend time on fixing our parks. We've got to fix our pedestrian network. Let's see, for 15 minutes. Uh, this number, I think, is really cool. 80% of Hong Kong people walk every day, so over three years old. 50% of the trips that are made uh, are, uh, are walking trips. So if you go shopping, walking to the restaurant, they walk to school, something to school. 50% of the trip is mechanized and often mechanized trip, 90% is public, public transport. So it means that everybody that walk, people have to walk to public transport and from public transport to, to their destination. So as a result, 80% of the people in Hong Kong walk every day. Park not be a park, which is kind of stops people from coming in and they, they try to keep people inside. But look at the park as an opportunity for connectivity and, and make them part of your pedestrian network then you'll have to ask LCSD to redesign that park. So how can it make it easy to walk from here to West Kowloon in the future? Well, right now you can't. You have to walk around, walk through the park, and kind of zigzag. So how, and if you come from here, there's no way. You can't. You, there's one entrance here, a staircase, and then you have to walk zigzag. Yeah, it's a beautiful park, but it's, it's, it's not designed for connectivity. But we could do. Um, we clean up our streets. Um, common poles. Uh, railings become opportunities for people to store goods um, everywhere. If you really start looking at the street, as you, as you do, look at all the railings. 
These things are not where there are no railings. These things are where there are railings. Railings are opportunities to create storage spaces. Um, signage. If you try to find the subway, uh, look at this little one here. You look at this, the, the, you're standing on this side of the road, you look at the peninsula, there's a sign that tells you to go to the MTR station, go here. And then you walk here, just a little bit away from the, and there's an MTR station to tell you to say, go there. Of course, this is the Chichester East MTR station, this is the Nathan Road MTR station, but as a tourist, how would you know? They look like just the MTR station. I mean, our sign is just, uh, it's all over the place. Uh, developers, uh, MTR, uh, Highways department. I mean, everybody has their own signage. Everybody uses their own name, their own codes. Um, how is anybody going to find their? The, the network is owned by several different organisations. Actually, if you go into the MTR station and you look at a map, this is the map in the MTR station. However, the network also consists of an, of a subway here, Sun Plaza, and also consists of the subways here, New World, and this one. There's an advertisement over the, this piece of the, of the tunnel. So the NTR net map doesn't show you the entire subway. So it, nobody thought about the subway as, as an alternative network, so just to show you that in more detail. Uh, north is not north. Uh, and um, I, I now I, I, I try to challenge it, and Becky Lou disagreed with me on this one. Uh, who's a professor here, so she, she's, she's my senior in this, uh, she's the chair of this meeting that I said that they should change. Legible London, which is the latest mapping project done in the world, which is really comprehensive and well, lots of money spent. Uh, their sign is they have, they have two. They have what they call the area map, and north and must always be north. And there is directional maps where you point people in the direction that they're going to move. But how do you do that at an MTNR station with a staircase is different when there's a map here and map here. So you've got to think about how you do that. But we really have to make a distinction between the area map and the directional map. And according to legible law, they must always be combined. There must always be a north-north map, an area map, and, there must, and then your directional map or sign and signage. But you've got to give both. A tourist that arrives in the, in the station right now, um, at uh, one point he will see the map this way, and then he arrives at the next exit, and the map is like this, the people standing there. Because a tourist will look at the map several times along the way, from the moment he, from his internet before he goes to the city, to when he, uh, 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 when he arrives, when he walks to the city, he walks at the area map constantly. So mapping is a real art, and uh, uh, we've got to figure out how the art and how we're going to make Hong Kong legible. So legible Hong Kong will be money well spent. Uh, Solomon at Hong Kong U tried to do a mapping, and he, he took the explosion mapping system that you see in a, in a shopping malls, and he took the entire district of uh, what of Admiralty, and he did an explosion. I don't think it works. It's more confusing. So this doesn't work. Uh, or then, we, then somebody tried to do, to do this and say, how about if we simplify it a lot? Um, you know, make the footpaths white, make it white where you can cross, grade the roads, and then you have different colors for what's elevated and subway, and then if you go on it, then you have to be handheld, you have to be with a computer, because you can't show them all three at the same time. Um, you know, you can actually then have a map for plus one and a map for minus one. Again, I don't think it's going to work. But if we want to be the leading city in terms of uh, pedestrian connectivity in, an, in a, a multi-layered city, we've got to figure out the mapping. Nobody has figured this out. We did the London map, the early part of the century. We, we, uh, the MTR is still using the London underground map system, basically. Uh, Hong Kong now will have to invent the mapping technology and the concept for a multi-layered city. It doesn't exist. We've got to figure it out. Um, what's going to make it easier if indoor locators, GPS locators that can be used indoor are going to be available. You can actually have it on your device. But right now, you, your GPS won't work in a tunnel system. Or in a, yeah, when you walk through IFC at any level, you can't see where you are, which level you are. So uh, GPS service solutions are not there yet. Um, here you go. Um, let me 
you see, if I don't think I have um, much more time left for um, for anything else to present here today. Let me go back briefly to the main presentation. I had a. Um, uh, if you're interested in this topic, um, there is a proposal for um, a additional tunnel in Corso Bay. It's going to cost billions of dollars. We're going to run under the road here, and um, the, the dotted line is the existing MTR tunnel. Then together, this is the and this is this Causeway Bay subway network. Now, again, if our street level is not going to be sufficient and we need a second overlapping network as an alternative, it's got to be a high quality network. And we all agree now on this one. This tunnel is um, just below the road. This tunnel is very deep. Um, and uh, there is nothing connecting to this tunnel. There's an exit here, there's an exit here, there's an exit here. There's no more shopping in it. Uh, at times it's four to six meters wide. Highways Department is working with the confines of what they can achieve. They can't negotiate with the landlords because that's a land department. They can only be on the public space, on the public roads, so they can only build something in the, in the roads. So this tunnel is done within the confines of all their technical problems the way they see it. And now they want to spend billions of dollars building this. My suggestion is we shouldn't even build it. Uh, we should build, we should improve the street level now. Or we should ask the MTR to improve and their extend their linkages to the NTR station. Um, you know, this is if somebody in the future is going to arrive at this tunnel entrance here, and he wants to be here, and it rains, you know, they're going to go over here, and they've got to go to this thing here, and then they're going to figure out how to get there and they come out here again. They're going to complain. They're going to say how horrible. You know, this is going to be this worse than Chin Cha Choi. You're going to have the same response from the community saying this is a really a bad alternative network for when it rains. It's not a good network. So we gotta we gotta get we gotta rethink how we plan this before we start spending billions of dollars. We can't operate within the current confines of, of our bureaucracy in, in planning this network. I don't have the picture, but uh, of a similar thing in one chart that's happening. This government is currently gazetting and looking for approval of a tunnel linking uh, the NGR station to a new development. Uh, uh, from the URA, which is, and uh, they only show the tunnel crossing under the road, they don't show anything else. And we're saying, well, you want to prove for this tunnel, you take public space under the road, okay? Um, how are people going to get in? We don't know, we're connecting with the building. So if it rains, and I want to use that network that we have given you public space for, you have to go through the shopping mall. Do I have 24 hour access through the shopping mall? They can't give answers. So again, if we want to make a high, if, if if it's important for our city to have a secondary network that's an alternative network provides additional capacity and got to be high quality, we've got to have a good plan for one shine and figure out how things are going to work and make sure that the public rights are well established before we're designing it. You know, otherwise we're going to be beholden to the developer that he gets his little link and then we have to go in there and then we get lost in the shopping. The shopping mall before you can enter in the empty stairs and go out on the other side. So again, but that there is no scheme, and there is a suggestion that Hobart has spoken to the URA about connecting the mega tower to that little and connecting the little tunnel that the MTR now asks approval for. Can we see the plan? We're not being shown the plan. It doesn't. Nobody is leading this as a whole, as a comprehensive. This is my this is my story to you. Uh, we usually end our seminar at uh, 1.30, hour, no, so we can have like maybe one or two questions. And uh, if you have more than like one or two questions, for those who have questions, you want to come or stay behind. Uh, I can stay behind to do so. so I'm, I'm not rushing. Any, any questions? Yeah. Yes, please. I wonder how you think if we are actually going to pedestrianize um, the Causeway Bay district we were actually selling. Just like, try to avoid another tunnel or subway? Uh, I think it can be done. It actually, if you go to the Corso Bay, the planning department in the study around 2000 for Corso Bay, mm -hmm. and their plan was really all about improving the street level connectivity and pedestrianizing more streets. Um, I don't have a, a thing to point, but um, 
the, the big issue is that, that they will say is that this is basically congested and overcrowded, and this street is overcrowded. And uh, so they're coming up with this tunnel on what they say is the main desire line. And, I say, and then my answer to that would be, the only reason that this is the main desire line is because you have removed the pedestrian crossing here. Sorry, here. You can't, is, it, is it Percival? Yeah, Percival Street. If you, if you force people up on a footbridge here and down here, everybody avoids this. Nobody wants to go here. And you got that bloody footbridge here. So nobody wants to go there. Now, if you make a pedestrian street level crossing here and here, and over, over time, shops will flourish, restaurants will flourish, the flow will spread out, you, you, you take the load off this one. And your people can walk from here to that MTR station. They don't go here to get into, into the MTR station. And if the MTR station extends another um, uh, entrance, say over here with a tunnel, and you can cross here, then I mean you can take, you can redistribute the traffic for the, the pedestrian flow and demand by uh, by doing it in a different way. So I think this tunnel of the resolving this major concession route is 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 taking that this is a given. You can redesign the flow. So I think we can resolve it in a different way. But nobody's thinking that way at this moment. Because, you know, so the only thing we can do is get, ask the NTR to do it. Uh, and they show they improve their links. So they, they don't do a silly tunnel. Uh, but they do just ex more exits, which they wanted to do in the various buildings and redevelopments. Um, and then work with the transport department to fix uh, the street level. But, you know, when somebody has to take that lead. The transport department, as I said before, and you see that in their idea, segregate off the road. Nasty people block the cars. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mentality issue, it's an attitude, and, and nobody's leading this right now from uh, with a different view. But I, I agree with you. So. One more question. You can always find me. Okay. I have one uh, concerning the kite tech you mentioned, the um, park above subway station. Kite tech station, I don't have a visual for it, no. Yeah, um, what is that? Like, uh, very much like this idea about not having... Actually, if you're really interested in the concept, uh, Chinese University uh, Architecture Department uh, worked on this uh, some years ago, and the project was called Linear City. It was funded, I believe, by the railway company and then didn't allow them to publish it because the finding was basically that it removed all the, all the property from the top of the station, which was not really in line with the, uh, the railway's objective. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the Kitech airport, you see now that it will be done. This is the, at the, on the apron level. It's not built yet. Oh, it's okay. part of the Shantin Central Link. But if you look at the plans for Kitech and you look at the plans for the Shantin Central Link, it's been gazetted already, I believe. So. You can see all the details already there. I believe that the spacing is not right, but that's a different issue. That's, uh, but the concept, I think, makes a lot of sense. At least we can do it in Hong Kong. You can't do this in New York if you want to replace a, a railway. You will have to build on top of the railway. Because otherwise you can't get the land ownership all sorted out and the financing sorted out. Okay, well, as a high-density city, then, uh, for those who took my course on sustainable cities, we can work on talking about like, accessibility, mobility, and then, of course, affordability. And uh, so I'd like to thank Paul for sharing uh, his work uh, on this topic. Extremely relevant to, to all of us, okay, we live in uh, to work and uh, play in Hong Kong. Okay, so thank you again. Okay, cheers. Yeah, that's good. Help me solve this problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Cheers. I'll leave you, I can leave you these materials, it's on the, there's a folder.